Eric Weinstein is a mathematician and he's a strategist for Teal Capital. And um, on Veterans Day, he sent out a tweet that said this. A century ago, my great uncle Sasha was killed serving at, a very, at the very end of World War I. The simple pointless loss of a sibling kicked my great grandma Mary from Orthodox Judaism into atheism, altering everything in my family's arc. The moral? It's the wise and kind gods we make that fail us. I didn't catch this when he first tweeted it, but it got talked about enough that I picked it up on the various conversations afterwards. And it tells in his tiny little story a very common story about so often why people give up on God because there's so much pain and so much suffering in the world that they can't believe that there is a God, and so the God that they're doubtful about, they respond with denying. And as he notes, this happened just after World War I, and because of the decision of his great-grandmother, the entire family's religious history was changed from a family that was practicing Orthodox Judaism to now. And you can interestingly enough notice that he skips the O, and this is a common practice from Jewish people to try to avoid taking the Lord's name in vain. And what I do know of, of Eric Weinstein is that even though he considers himself an atheist, he actually does go to synagogue because he believes that there's something in it. Now, this really exemplifies so much of religious relationships with so many people. And, and you can see right there that on one hand, he can't quite divorce himself from, let's say, a God who orders and a God who decides, but also can't dare imagine a God who cares. And there are a lot of people like this, as I discover in by experience on YouTube in the internet world. In fact, I just finished When My Sister Died. I began to reread C.S. Lewis's great book, A Grief Observed. And as I was reading that book, I was more interested in the person that C.S. Lewis was greeting, which was Joy Davidman. Joy Davidman grew up an atheist Jew in New York City who in her young years exemplified a lot of the social chaos and conversation that we have today. She was an outspoken atheist, an outspoken communist, and an outspoken feminist. And this is how she came of age in New York. And she married a man who went over to fight in the Spanish Civil War, which was a cause celeb at the beginning of the 20th century. And I found her biography fascinating in terms of how many of the issues we are dealing with today were dealt with in the 30s and 40s in the United States and around the world. But she eventually began to read the writings of C.S. Lewis, and bit by bit, she began to believe that there is a God. But through much of her life, she struggled with this God, and she went over into Dianetics and a bunch of other things. And in fact, as her marriage was souring, I would describe her pursuit of C.S. Lewis as something like a stalker. She basically kidnapped her own children, brought them to England while she was still married in hopes of somehow getting C.S. Lewis to fall in love with her. It's quite a story. And as things, and, and as I read the story, being a pastor and knowing many other people's stories, I thought, yeah, this is what life is like in this crazy world. And people are all over the map. She eventually stopped being a communist and became a Christian, and her marriage, her husband then took up with her, with her cousin, and she eventually was able to get close enough to C.S. Lewis, and he did fall in love with her. And her, she had her two boys in England, and then not too long after they were married, she in fact died of cancer. And that's the grief that he processes in this book. And you can see through all of these complexities, through all of the stuff 
in life. And many of them were expressed in the, in the joys and concerns today. This is what life is like in this world. C.S. Lewis, who had been an atheist, had given up on God as a boy, and was a virulent atheist, and then becomes a Christian, and then becomes a rather outspoken Christian writer, after his wife died, he writes this. Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him. So happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption. If you feel yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain. And what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting at the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once. And seeming was as strong as, um, and that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of trouble? I tried to put some of these thoughts to sea this afternoon. He reminded me that the same thing seems to have happened to Christ. Why hast thou forsaken me? I know. Does that make it easier to understand? Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe that such dreadful coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not so there is no God after all, but so this is what God's really like. Deceive yourself no longer. Now what struck me about Eric Weinstein's quote is that no ancient person would ever speak like his great grandma, his great grandma Mary. Because all of these ideas actually arose mostly in the modern period. Ancient people would have said, as Job's wife said, curse God and die. But in the Enlightenment, we somehow began to feel we could manage this world. C.S. Lewis noted, before he lost his wife, actually before he met his wife, in a book he had written about pain, called The Problem of Pain, and this is what he wrote. And you can see him struggling to hold these two worlds together. The Christian doctrine of suffering explains, I believe, a very curious fact about the world we live in. The settled happiness and security which we all desire, God withholds from us by the very nature of the world. But joy, pleasure, and merriment, he scattered broadcasts. We are never safe, but we have plenty of fun and some ecstasy. It is not hard to see why. The security we crave would teach us to rest our hearts in this world and oppose an obstacle and oppose an obstacle to our return to God. A few moments of happy love, a landscape, a symphony, a merry meeting with our friends, a bath or a football match have no such tendency. Our Father refreshes us on the journey with some pleasant ends, but will not encourage us to mistake them for home. Alvin Plantinga, who was the brother of my, my theology professor at Calvin Seminary, wrote a book, God, Freedom, and Evil. And he said, you know, the problem of evil is not really a philosophical dilemma. In terms of the philosophy of it, it's not a difficult thing. The difficult thing is the pastoral side, as Tim Keller noted in his book. It's how we feel when we feel abandoned or alone or left behind, or a victim, or unloved, or depressed. There is also, however, a subtle demand beneath the complaint. We, like the prodigal son of Luke 15, want God's stuff, but we don't want him. 
We wish to be squatters on his estate, but he would have us restored as sons and daughters. Secularity presumes the land has no owner, and the ancients presumed God was unavailable. But most of us squat, whether it's outside the building, or in a campground, or by a river, and we have a happy day, and we don't like to remember the truth we all know. All happy days end. None of our squatting lasts forever. A day comes when we can squat no more. Luke says this, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Over the last couple of years, with politics, not so much economics right now, but with social turmoil, people have been wondering, which way is up? Do the old rules still hold? Will things in the future get better, or will we slide? Are we at a precipice? Can we be secure? Not too many years ago, Harold Camping put up signs. Judgment Day, according to his calculations, was going to come in May, and then later when it didn't come, he thought it would come in October. Skeptics on both sides, both Christians and atheists, looked at that and mocked. But the truth is, it comes. It always comes. Before the housing collapse, many of you will remember someone saying, well, the markets will just keep going up and up and up. And others said, markets never go up and up and up. They go up and they go down. But then everyone said, well, no one will know when it happens which isn't exactly true, because in fact, the group of men that this movie was about was about people that had a pretty good idea when it was happened, and they bet on it, and many of them won large, as just about everybody else lost. Because the truth is, the day always comes. We don't know how, we don't know when, and we don't know the particulars, but it does always come. The Bible has a name for this, and it's called the Day of the Lord. And the Day of the Lord is known as Judgment Day. But the way the Bible talks about it, that day comes again and again and again. It comes to each of us on the day of our death. It came to the residents of paradise the day the fire kept came swarming down from the mountains. It will come to Sacramento someday when this huge system of levees and bypasses fail and are overwhelmed. It will come. If you ask Maury about the flood, Maury will probably agree that it's not really a question of if, it's a question of when. There will come a flood that the system can't handle, and it comes to all of us in different ways. It's a pre-echo. It came in the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. It came in a plague of locusts, as told in the prophet Joel. It came in darkness at Golgotha. The final day comes, and it comes to all. Jeremiah was waiting and watching it come in real time. While the Babylonians were working on the walls of Jerusalem, Jeremiah was imprisoned by the king for saying, this is the judgment of the Lord against his people. The Babylonians will win and you will lose. The king didn't like hearing that, so he locked him up. While Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the houses in this city and the royal palaces of Judah that have been torn down to be used against the siege ramps and the sword. 
in the fight with the Babylonians. They will be filled with dead bodies of the people I will slay in my anger and wrath. I will hide my face from this city because of all of its wickedness. And you hear that and you think, oh, is this a God I want to worship? Do I like the way this sounds? Nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will heal my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. I will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity and we will rebuild them as they were before. I will cleanse them from all the sin they have committed against me and forgive all their sins of rebellion against me. Then this city will bring me renown, joy, praise, and honor before all nations on earth that hear of all the good things I do for it. And they will be in awe and will tremble at the abundant prosperity and peace I provide for it. This is what the Lord says. You say about this place, it is a desolate waste without people or animals. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither people nor animal, there will be heard once more the sound of joy and gladness, the voice of bride and bridegroom, the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were before, says the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In this place, desolate and without people or animals, in all its towns there will again be pastures for shepherds to rest their flocks. In the towns of the hill country, of the western foothills and in the Negev, in the territory of Benjamin, in the villages around Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, flocks will again pass under the hand of the one who counts them, says the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which I will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Hmm. All this comes to Jeremiah as the Babylonians are destroying his city and are about to lead them into captivity. Now, great grandma Mary made an exchange, one she probably didn't completely think through. Because we declare the land unowned, or the landlord absent, but what we usually suffer from are all the other squatters. We are still at the mercy of the more powerful squatters, the chief of which is death. And Jesus says in Luke, at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And here, 2,000 years later, we're still reading them. Now what does this mean? Will we see the day of the Lord? Each of us will. Gigi saw a little one this morning in the accident. When there's a car accident and you feel that terror, you feel the day of the Lord. When the news comes on and says the stock market dropped 10 percentage points, you feel a little of the day of the Lord. When the doctor sits across from you and says, I'm concerned about that lump, you feel a little of the day of the Lord. When the phone rings and your child is abroad and you wonder, where are they? You feel a little of the day of the Lord. It is there all the time. 
And the question is, what will you do? How will you respond? Where will you turn? Jesus gives this advice. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. What does that mean? Carousing and drunkenness. The day of the Lord is coming. Eat, drink, and be merry. Escape with distractions and dissipation to buffer yourself emotionally. Jesus says, if you do this, you won't be able to face it. You're avoiding. Don't avoid. Also, don't give in to the anxieties of life. But you say, well, how can we have the courage to face it? Because it's terrible. And we feel it. And we know it. And there's no escape. Or is there? For it will come to all those who live on the face of the whole earth. None of us are exempt of it. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Stand before the Son of Man? What does that mean? The day of the Lord comes and, and in that moment when we feel the terror that we are not in control of our lives, that we are not in control of our bodies, that we are not in control of the economy, that we are not in control of the world order, and we realize and we are exposed in that moment as being small and out of control, and we can't even manage our own emotions. Jesus says, I am the Son of Man, and you must stand before me. Orient your life in that way, so that when the day comes, you may be ready. Ready for what? Ready for your deliverance. This is the Son of Man. Because as you know, the disciples were going about their business. They had gone to Jerusalem. They were about to celebrate the Passover with Jesus. And they knew things were dangerous. And, and they knew things were about to happen. They didn't know the day of the Lord was about to come upon them. But Jesus knew. Because after the meal, they would go to the, they would go to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus would pray and they would sleep. And the guards would come and Jesus would be arrested. And he would be beaten and he would be crucified and the sky would darken and the earthquake would come and all of the elements of the day of the Lord would come and Jesus on the cross would cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was in that moment the victim. But three days later, he would arise as the Son of Man to receive a kingdom. And his disciples would go through this process again and again and again. So when you are in the grip of the day of the Lord, when you hear the bad news, when you feel the terror, when you know that you have no hold to grip onto to stop your arrest, Look for the Son of Man. Look for His deliverance. Look for the promises He makes. Misery, deliverance, gratitude. Every one of my sermons, they're up there. Misery, deliverance, gratitude. You know you cannot save yourself. Look to the one who can save you and live out of that salvation. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. The day of the Lord is about to come upon me. And I will feel abandoned. And I will feel the victim of all. I will feel the victim of injustice. But my God will save me and raise me from the dead. Jesus gives it to his disciples and says, I am inviting you into my story. And you might say, well, well, pastor, I don't feel that. Right. 
You don't always feel that. This is what you lean into. You say, as others said to Jesus, help me believe. And because he knows we are weak, he gives us his body. And he says, come to my table. Eat from my table. Let me give you my life so that when you walk through my death, you will also receive my resurrection. This is the food he feeds you with. This is the way he strengthens you. Remember, take, and believe. Savior walked into the day of the Lord so that you could follow him through it. This is his body given for you. <coughs> we say blood is thicker than water. Jesus said, this is a new covenant in my blood. The blood of animals could hold the day back. My blood shed for you leads you through into new life. Yeah. 
believe that our Lord gave his life to turn squatters into sons and daughters. Would you stand? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. <coughs>